Shara, uh, Vice President, uh, New America Foundation and Director of our Asset Building Program. Uh, welcome to today's event on uh, responsible homeownership, protecting homeowners today and guiding policymakers uh, going forward. Um, I should let, let you all know that C-SPAN is here today, as is uh, AP, PBS, and Fox. So whatever you say is definitely on the record. Uh, we are uh, very pleased uh, to co-sponsor uh, today's event with our friends at the Center for Community Capitalism at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They will present some groundbreaking and obviously very timely research on the ability of low-income uh, low income people to build homeownership wealth given access to the right products and processes and to, and to demonstrate that homeownership for low-income people is still a very valid public policy goal, one that we should definitely pursue. I'm also very pleased that Eric Stein, my friend and colleague at Self Help, has joined us here uh, today. Uh, his, his work has been superb over the years and uh, it's great to be partnering with him. And uh, finally, I'd like to also, uh, before introducing Chairman Baer, uh, thank Mark Willis from the Ford Foundation for joining us as well. Uh, the Ford Foundation, as some of you know, uh, generously funded the, the research uh, that uh, we'll be talking about today. And more generally, uh, the Ford Foundation, uh, it's, not even a, it's not even possible to imagine all of our work on asset building, uh, savings, and financial services without the leadership of the Ford Foundation over, over many years. So let me turn now to my introduction of Chairman Baer. Uh, I'm most honored to introduce uh, her. Uh, she's been heading up the FDIC since June 2006. And uh, a dear friend of New America, she has many more admirers here than she's even aware of. Uh, Chairman Baer and I happen to share a passion for children's savings accounts and the revolutionary impact we believe those accounts would have on financial education um, around the nation. But we're not here to talk about that today. We will in the future. Uh, today, of course, uh, uh, we are going to, Chairman Baer is going to talk to us about uh, her work on homeownership, in particular protecting uh, vulnerable homeowners, making sure that they can stay in their homes. Uh, Chairman Baer has had, had uh, demonstrated superb, prescient, and courageous uh, leadership on this issue, as many of you know. Um, keeping trouble, troubled homeowners in their homes and the upward spiraling effects that that will have on our economy. CNN recently called her the consistent voice of reason uh, through, for her relentless focus on homeowners, uh, keeping in, them or ho in their homes and on consumers and the, the focus on Main Street uh, for, uh, uh, yeah, for, for those on Main Street in our, in our nation. And very importantly as well, she's done enormous, made an enormous contribution to restoring trust in our public institutions. Um, I cannot sing her praises loudly enough. Uh, at New America, we've batted around the idea of, 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 of having public service awards, and I have no doubt that if we were to do that, Chairman Bear would be our first recipient. So uh, Chairman Bear will speak for about 20 minutes. And uh, then uh, we'll have uh, Q&A, uh, which will be moderated by Ellen Seidman, uh, former head of the Office of Thrift Supervision and Director of Financial Services Policy here at New America. Chairman Baer. Thank you, Ray. That was a very uh, kind introduction. And uh, I do in indeed. Uh, uh, share the passion of this organization for uh, for savings and asset accumulation starting at a very early age. And we'll be, be able to get back to that issue, too, at some point, I hope. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to speak. What a year it has been. As we close the books on 2008, I hope we don't see another one like it, though I think it is going to be tough in 2009. I don't think anyone on the planet, even a year or two ago, could have predicted what we've been through. And as you know, we were one of the early alarm sounders on this, but I think even, even uh, we at the FDIC have been taken back by just how severely uh, uh, the problems in the housing market have, have had broader impact. When I took office in June 2006, I thought it would be regular hours, 9 to 5, trips to the Swiss Alps to talk about global capital rules, and that my biggest headache would be whether Walmart should have a bank. Um, what we'd like to do today, but what I'd like to do today is uh, bury two myths that have been circulating lately. The first myth is that the Community Reinvestment Act caused the financial crisis. And the second myth is that working with troubled homeowners to reduce foreclosures lacks urgency and may be akin to a fool's errand. 
I think we can agree that a complex interplay of risky behaviors by lenders, borrowers, and investors led to the current financial storm. To be sure, there's plenty of blame to go around. However, I want to give you my verdict on CRA. It is not guilty. Point of fact, only about one in four higher-priced first mortgage loans were made by CRA-covered banks during the heyday years of subprime mortgage lending 2004 through 2006. The rest were made by private, independent mortgage companies or large bank affiliates not covered by CRA rules. You've probably heard the line of attack. The government told banks they had to make loans to people who were bad credit risks and could not afford to repay, just to prove that they were making loans to low and moderate income people. Well, let me ask you, where in the CRA does it say make loans to people who don't have the means to repay them? Nowhere. And the fact is, the lending practices that are causing problems today were driven by a desire for market share and revenue growth, pure and simple. CRA isn't perfect, but it has stayed around more than 30 years because it does work. It encourages FDIC-insured banks to lend in low and moderate income areas, and I quote, consistent with the safe and sound operation of such institutions. Another question. Is lending to borrowers under terms they cannot afford to repay consistent with the safe and sound operations of those institutions? No, of course not. CRA has always recognized that there are limitations on the potential volume of lending in lower income areas due to safety and soundness constraints, and that a bank's capacity and opportunity for safe and sound lending in the LMI community may be limited. That is why the CRA never set out lending target or goal amounts. And that is why CRA supporters, many of you here today, have labored for three decades to figure out, figure out how to do it safely. It makes no sense to give a loan to someone under terms you know they can't pay back. That's a setup for failure. Despite our current problems, the homeowner is still one of the best credit risks in the world, and I think your research today shows that. Today, the delinquency rate on all home mortgages is only 3.6%. And for subprime loans, there is a stark difference in the type of loan. The rate of seriously delinquent subprime fixed rate loans is a little more than one third, one third the rate of subprime arms. Any family willing to work, save money, pay the mortgage on their house is a sound basis of credit and a sound basis for America. So let the record show, CRA is not guilty of causing this financial crisis. That brings me to the other myth I want to dispel, that we can end the housing crisis without modifying troubled mortgages to make them affordable for millions of people facing foreclosure. The housing crisis was caused by loose lending practices and unaffordable mortgages, and now unnecessary foreclosures are a very serious threat to a housing recovery. Millions of Americans are saddled with mortgages they cannot afford and are in danger of losing their homes. The huge surge in foreclosures is hurting everyone by depressing housing values and putting more borrowers at risk. Many are suffering from the recession through lost jobs, lost savings, and lost communities. As regulators, we need to use our authority and clout to stop it and get the country out of the foreclosure crisis. This has got to be a top priority. While there are no magic bullets and a multi-pronged effort is needed, the core issue is lowering borrowers' monthly payments to an affordable and sustainable level. In recent months, we've seen federal and state governments and consumer groups work with some success to encourage the industry to modify loans. And we're now seeing some larger scale initiatives being undertaken, something I believe is key to any solution. But we're still behind the curve. We need a fast track national effort. We successfully launched such a program for systematically modifying loans at IndyMac Federal, a California bank we took over in July. To date, we've verified incomes and completed modifications for over 7,500 loans, with thousands more in the pipeline. Using this as a model for a loan mod in a box national program, we think we could help 1.5 million families avoid foreclosure using about $24 billion in government financing. This would help get at the root cause of the credit crunch and the economic recession. We are gaining, gaining ground and support. The American Bankers Association endorsed our program last week. I was very pleased to see that. They believe that many more borrowers across the country can be helped. And I think their support, the industry supports, underscores the business case for loan modifications. There are still some who question the effectiveness of loan modifications. And they've been pointing to recent data suggesting that many modified loans end up redefaulting, putting borrowers back in trouble. Well, I think I beg to differ on that. At, ver at the very least, the jury remains out. Last week, the Office of the Comptroller and the Office of Thrift Supervision released a report on mortgages that has been cited to show substantial redefaults on modifications. 
Unfortunately, it is hard to draw conclusions from this report for three key reasons. First, the report simply defines a modification as any change in contract terms. Many past modifications were simply short-term fixes that did not create a sustainable payment for borrowers, and Comptroller Dugan has agreed that sustainable modifications should perform much better. Second, the report covers a period before most sustainable modification approaches were adopted. In November, Freddie, Fannie, and the Hope Now Alliance announced that they were adopting many of the features of the FDIC's model. And finally, media stories unfortunately focused on delinquencies after only 30 days. While those made for very big numbers, the 60-day delinquency figure reported by the OCC is, is, uh, was more, much lower, around 35 percent, and generally the industry defines redefault or, or distress for delinquencies that at least go 60 if not 90 days. Experience shows that a large percentage of 30-day delinquent mortgages will become current again, which is why the industry does not use uh, anything shorter than a 60-day delinquency as an as a indicator of redefault. As we have distressed, a sustainable modification must be based on affordability. The FDIC's approach focuses on creating an affordable and sustainable monthly mortgage payment based on verified income. Using a combination of interest rate reductions capped at a prime conforming rate, amortization extensions, and in some cases principal deferment, produces modifications that will last and we believe dramatically lower the redefault rate. Indeed, a recent Credit Suisse study found that modifications based on interest rate changes had a 15 percent redefault rate, and those that had principal reductions had a 23 percent redefault rate. We've been urging servicers to focus on affordability, income verification, setting mortgage-related payments at 31 to 38 percent of monthly income, and fixing interest rates and including lifetime interest rate caps. Some invested analysts are beginning to come around. Just yesterday, Fitch Ratings announced that it was looking to well-structured modifications as a key part of its ratings for servicers. As Fitch Managing Director Huxley Somerville said, quote, modifications, when properly done, can benefit U.S. homeowners and investors. The FDIC has been reworking troubled loans of failed banks for decades. We have a lot of practical experience in dealing with troubled assets. We know how to do this, and we believe it does need to be done on a national scale. Let me raise a final issue. Largely because we've waited so long to act effectively, we have a new problem. Scam artists preying on distressed homeowners. We need to work closely with consumer groups, prominent policy gurus like yourselves and others to warn distressed homeowners about these scam artists offering help for a hefty fee. A member of Congress recently called me with a heartbreaking story of a financially strapped family with an unaffordable mortgage who had paid $2,500 to a quote foreclosure prevention specialist to get a loan modification. We were able to refer the family to the proper servicing agent, who of course does loan modifications to qualified borrowers at no cost. Please help us get the word out that borrowers should contact reputable housing counselors through groups such as NeighborWorks of America or work with their servicer directly. It's very important for qualified borrowers to understand that the industry best practice is loan modifications free of charge. They do not need to spend thousands of dollars to get help. It's also important for borrowers to understand that if they have an affordable payment, they should keep paying on their mortgage. Even under the IndyMac program, if the net present value of the modified loan does not exceed the foreclosure value, the loan will have to go into foreclosure. So that while we can help a lot of people, we can't help everyone. Borrowers risk losing their homes if they purposely become delinquent to try to get a lower mortgage payment. The best thing they can do is to stay current on their loans. Let me end with this. Consumer protection, notwithstanding some skepticism, consumer protection by bank regulators is not an oxymoron, but we do need to change how we do it and do it better. The rules need to be working to match a changing industry and changing consumer needs. Instead of playing catch up, we need to keep pace with the times, making the way we operate flexible and nimble enough to respond quickly to changing and often unpredictable market demands. So I want to thank the Center for Community Capital and its many sponsors for your, your new study on LMI lending. We need more thoughtful, comprehensive research like this so we can design policies and programs that are more effective in delivering credit to families of modest means, which is needed now more than ever. I look forward to working with you going forward as we work to reshape the nation's consumer protections and bolster public confidence in our financial system. It's going to be another tough year in 2009, and we're preparing for it, but we will work through it, and by 2010, I believe we will see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
you so much, Tim sure. Boo. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions to get us started, and then we'll open it to the floor. Um, we would like to ask people who aren't with the press, who have a lot of opportunities to uh, to uh, talk to Chairman Bear, uh, to start. So we're, we're, we're going to do non-press first and um, speak up and tell us uh, where you're from and what your name is. So, uh, but first, um, Sheila, uh, recently you've become uh, pretty explicit about the need for investors to get with the program mm -hmm. and to uh, stop threatening lawsuits <laughs> and, um, you know, to really understand that we're all in this together and if they keep making trouble, uh, we're not going to be able to do the, the modifications that we need to. Do you have some suggestions about what the federal government might do to encourage that? Right. Well, our, our loss sharing program, we think, is designed to address uh, one of the issues that they frequently raise, which is rate of fault risk. And the problem is uh, that, that stated, and it is, it is a legitimate issue, that is the housing market keeps going down. Uh, if you decide to modify the loan instead of foreclose, and then 10, 12 months later it does redefault, and you have to foreclose at that point, you're going to have recovered less value. So that's exp expressly why we've suggested some loss sharing with government 50-50 um, to, to try to cover that risk. Um, so we're, we're, that is a carrot approach. Uh, there are stick approaches as well, obviously. Uh, there's the, the bankruptcy bill is, is uh, still there, and I assume the vote count is going to be changing on that in the next Congress. Uh, and there's other, I hear increasingly talk about invalidating some contractual provisions as contrary to public policy out of sheer frustration uh, that we do have this, this pushback. So I would say in defense of investors that we've had a fairly positive experience uh, at NEMAC. Uh, we had the legal authority to modify these loans. But we briefed the investors, and they were acquiescent, and that was fortunate. And uh, so uh, we will keep pushing. Uh, but I do think uh, the more that there is uh, are threats of lawsuits, uh, I think there is uh, a definite uh, risk of a backlash, which, which they should keep in mind. Everybody's going to need to take some losses on this, and especially some of these large hedge funds and other institutional investors to suggest they didn't have the wherewithal to analyze the loan quality in, the, in these mortgage pools. I just, I just think that is not... Uh, Credible, and uh, so you know there needs to be market discipline all around. And investors uh, did not; they looked at factors other than uh, what uh, the loan quality was in these pools. And so now they need to take some losses, just like everyone else. And uh, speaking of the NEMAC, I mean you've done a really nice job. There've there have been a lot of modifications, much faster than would have been uh, possible under other programs. But obviously, there's some loans that can't be modified right, right. Uh, for whatever reason. Right. Which means you've got loans right. that you can't do anything with. Right. It means you've got REO. What are you right. doing with that, right. and what would you suggest on a more broad basis? Right. Well, that's a good question. I think we do uh, the, the streamlined mods is, is a, a good bulk of them. Uh, and even when we can't do a streamlined mod, we still do some customized mods. Uh, also, uh, we try where we can to do a, an FHA refinancing. That's that's more difficult, especially for the the service portfolio because they prohibit, like a lot of uh, PSAs prohibit uh, principal write downs, which generally you need to do that to get into an FHA refinancing. Um, and then some borrowers who we make the loan mod offer simply come back and say we just can't do it, and and they're ready to move on. So uh, there's a cash for keys program. There's also a rental program. Uh, up to six months, I've asked the staff to look at me the way that should be extended. I think rental agreements for those those borrowers who just simply can't, uh, the modified, you'd have to reduce the payment so much that the modification just won't exceed foreclosure value. Uh, that if we can do more of that, I think that would be helpful. And uh, the REO, uh, you know, we need to uh, make sure the houses are, are appropriately taken care of and uh, that, uh, um, uh, again, I think the rental, there's so much housing stock on the market that's going to be, I think, more, way more and more in favor of doing rental agreements where you can't do uh, the modification. But we're, as with any case, we're using multiple tools uh, to try to help as many people as we can. And if they do need to lose the home, uh, offering some financial support and, and ability to make a transition. What do you say to banks who say, we're not in the property management business, we can't rent them? <laughs> Well, um, they, actually they can. Uh, I think if, if you go out more than five years, which would be a long time, uh, there are some, some capital repercussions. But, uh, you know, we, we think uh, rental agreements are part of, of uh, any appropriate loss mitigation strategy. And they do need to think, again, as, it, as in the case of a lot of this, it's, it's helpful for the borrowers, but it's also good business sense. If you're going to take such steep losses in the foreclosure market, which you're going to do right now, and you can't do a loan modification, well, a rental agreement should be another option to look at. And uh, Yes, unless it goes beyond five years, I think uh, it is uh, it is possible uh, within the the current uh, framework uh, for banks to do that. And one last question: um, Obviously, with house prices dropping, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of 
buying opportunities. Right. And, you know, eventually, hopefully, credit will become a little bit looser. Um, what are your suggestions for, as we go forward, avoiding this problem right. again? Right. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think the uh, the Fed uh, should be applauded, and Chairman Bernanke, who took a personal leadership role in this and finalizing the HOPA rules, which now apply, you know, good strong lending standards across the board, including ability to repay as a standard, income documentation as a standard that applies to everyone now, not just banks. I think there is still weakness in the enforcement mechanism, though, outside the banking sector, and that continues to concern me. I, I still, you probably do the same thing. You go online, and you're st I'm still seeing these teaser rate ads, and where are these coming from? Who is funding these? Um, so I think there is there's still some issues about uh, adequacy enforcement, and I, I assume that will be something Congress will be taking up uh, next year. But clearly, um, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of the lenders who are doing this are not in business any longer. There were some banks doing it too, uh, and we need to fess up to that. But I think the, the regulators got uh, guidance out some time ago, uh, correcting this and taking uh, vigorous uh, enforcement action where it was appropriate. So I think regarding banks. Um, I think we do. We have uh, hopefully uh, virtually eliminated it, and uh, I think consumer education is also an important part of this going forward. Um, you know, people, please understand the mortgage that you're that you're undertaking, and uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with a 30-year fixed mortgage. <laughs> it's got a nice steady payment. You know exactly what you're going to be making for the duration of the mortgage, and uh, you know, so uh, if there's still people out there offering you teaser rate mortgages, hopefully they're not. But it's it's not lawful, and and don't listen to it because it's it's going to get you in trouble later on. Okay, let's open it up. Jeff, uh, stand up. We've got a mic. Uh, state your name and where you're from. Hi, I'm Jeff Lisher, National Association of Realtors. Uh, follow up to Ellen's question. And I understand that the FDIC insured banks are not the biggest part of the problem, but yeah. didn't uh, they provide a lot of capital to subprime lending lenders like New Century? Mm -hmm. And so they were. You know, making it possible. Is there anything you can do in the future now that right. we see what the abuses have been right. to try to um, be more aggressive on where banks invest their their money? Right. Well, we're, we are not the primary regulator for for some of the institutions. I think you're uh, you're referring to, though, though we may have had some ourselves. Uh, you know, my view is is that it's unsafe and sound to fund an unsafe and sound loan as well, uh, and uh, so uh, I that would be our our view as uh, to the extent we're the primary regulator of some of those institutions. I think ASINI liability is something the Congress needs to look at next year. They were considering it. Uh, we think it would be helpful. Uh, it would be helpful to, you know, frankly to protect investors as well for those that are going to be funding these uh, these mortgages and then passing on the, uh, the risk if the securitization market ever comes back. Um, to have some responsibility for basic screens, I think you need to have uh, responsibility uh, go to areas where realistically the securitizer can screen, but certainly, uh, you know, income verification, DTI ratios, there are certain, you know, objectively ascertainable um, features of, of safe and sound lending that, that, that uh, those who are funding these mortgages can screen for. So going forward, I think some, some reasonable balanced approach on assignee liability will also help. Uh, Chao Chen, freelance correspondent. And uh, as uh, subprime mortgage uh, indicate, the borrower are not qualified. And in the structure loan, you emphasize the affordability. And uh, that would be hard to meet. And second is this, uh, should we lower the, lower the uh, mortgage process fee? Thank you. The, the processing fee? Um. Like the guarantee fee on for GSE loans, or, um, or the, the who's, only origination fees the origination in the whole fees. process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, I, I think it, it's an interplay of affordability uh, versus um, versus uh, recoupment of cost. Uh, I do think that uh, from a policy perspective, we need to have origination fee structures that are tied to the long-term sustainability of the loan. So whatever uh, whatever uh, fees are incurred, I think they should be tied to long-term performance. And these kind of short-term, originate the loan, get a fat fee, sell it off, and don't worry about it ever again. That's exactly what has got us into this, the problem. So what you call the fee may be less important about when you get paid for it. And tying it to long-term performance, I think, is going to be important. And I'm sorry, what was the first part of your question? I didn't first quite catch all of it. Uh, affordability. Uh, 
affordability. They are affordability. income already low. Yes, yes. And I think no matter how you structure, yeah. I think they still can meet it. Well, that's right, and we do find that uh, at Mac and, and other services that find it as well. And under our modification protocol, if, if the modified loan does not exceed the foreclosure value, uh, then it does need to go into foreclosure, or we try to make other arrangements with the rental agreement or a short sale. So, and you're right, there are some borrowers that just simply do not have, uh, the their income would support only a very radically restructured mortgage that's not going to pass the test of, of comparing it to foreclosure value. So other options have to be undertaken. Well, sir, sir, be sir, I think, I think we're, we're ready for another question, if you don't mind. Okay, um, yes, go ahead. State your name and where you're from. Uh, Lindley Higgins, uh, NeighborWorks America. Uh, what are the obstacles to preventing foreclosure seems to be the incentive structure and the capacity of right. the servicers. Yeah. What's being done to address that particular right. obstacle? Well, the incentive is, is again addressed through our loss sharing program. We would have a thousand dollar administrative fee paid to the servicers in addition to the loss sharing if the loan redefaulted later on. And you're right, uh, most of these pooling and servicing agreements, the one I've seen, you can get your administrative cost reimbursed if you go to foreclosure, but if you're working out a loan, there's, there's nothing in the PSA to to reimburse that, so um, that there there is a, there are skewed economic incentives there, and I'm sorry. What was your other question? The other part of your question was uh, the, the capacity of the. The capacity is, that's a problem, you know, and we uh, we uh, uh, were very careful at NEMAC, but I think uh, this is something that we continue to work on and other servicers as well, to make sure you have enough staff, and make sure they're trained, you know, and you can but you can save yourself a lot of time with a systematic approach. So instead of having your servicing reps try to individually renegotiate every single loan, you have a systematic protocol, everybody gets this, meaning these criteria, and you can get it done a lot faster. But they, they, but they need to be trained, too. They need to be told, you know, that this is uh, uh, what you do and this is what you offer for, for this category of borrowers. So I think with the streamlined approach, you can make it easier for the servicing staff. And if they have adequate training, you can also speed up the process. Okay. Uh, Cliff? Hi, Cliff Kellogg from Shorebank Corporation. Uh -huh. uh, this morning's Washington Post uh, has an article about the fact that the Congress's recent effort to create right. a loan mod program has resulted in only 400 something uh, homeowners participating right. in a program that was expected for 400,000. Right. So my question is, uh, in your experience, how much of this do you think is due to the design of the economics of a home mod program, and how much of it may be psychological uh, dimension of homeowners not yet being ready to come forward with a loan mod program. The homeowners not being willing to participate um, in these programs. Well, I think that it's probably a combination. I, I think in terms of federal policies, uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, and I hear it all the time, and I'm, I'm I understand the sentiment, but there's still a lot of pushback at helping any of these bar these borrowers, quote unquote. That you know, people. Well, I didn't take a high-risk mortgage. I didn't. I don't have an ILTV. I'm still current on my mortgage. So why should you uh, help help the guy next door? And uh, I, I think we need to get beyond that uh, because you know it's in our economic best interest to do this. It makes good business sense to do it. And a lot of these borrowers were uh, unfairly taken advantage of with poor marketing. You know, don't worry about this. You can refinance later. The housing market's going to go up forever. Very complex terms. Other borrowers knowingly got in over their head. And uh, but at this point, uh, does it make sense to keep debating this and in an effort to be punitive uh, towards those you view as unsympathetic, you have a program that doesn't work. So, uh, you know, we believe strongly it's in our economic best interest uh, as a nation to do this. We believe it's in investors uh, and other mortgage owners' best interest to do this, their business interest as well. Uh, but I think the economic case needs to be uh, uh, more, uh, more heavily uh, emphasized. And uh, that's, that's something we've tried to do. And again, the FDIC, a lot of people say, well, why is the FDIC involved in this? Well, we have. I mean, it's in our business interest to restructure troubled mortgages. When a bank fails, we, you know, we pay off the deposits, we cover the deposits, and then we, we recover our costs by selling assets. And frequently, a failed bank will have a lot of delinquent loans. So restructuring loans, whether residential mortgages, commercial mortgages, whatever, is something we've been doing for a long time. And we do it because it makes good business sense. And that's really, I think, the message that needs to get out right now. Okay. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good Fred morning. Applequist from Understanding Government Foundation. Mm -hmm. How will you know uh, we've been successful in getting out of this mess? What sort of metrics are you going to be looking at down the road that will tell us? Right. Well, I think that certainly the foreclosure rate uh, is, is one indicator. Uh, 
home market, home value declines, that's stabilizing or at least slowing, and it, it is a, a little bit in, in some areas of the country already. Uh, I think those would be two important metrics. Um, but the foreclosure rate uh, is uh, is uh, certainly something we've been very focused on. It's been slowing a bit, but I'm afraid it's slowing only because states and local governments have become more active in, in putting moratorium on foreclosure activity. I, I don't think it's the, the delinquency rates are going up in these mortgages. And we've got, we're in this wave of option arms now. I mean, the tragedy of this is that the subprime resets, we're almost through those, and a lot of subprime borrowers have lost their home when probably they shouldn't have because we didn't have a systematic approach. But now we have these option arms uh, coming in. And so, again, the structure of the loans, and we have more economic distress, so people having their hours cut back, a spouse losing a job, you know, reduced commission income. So there will be other, you know, more, more traditional uh, uh, sources of, of distress for these mortgages. And so uh, it's, it's just going to keep, the delinquencies are going to keep ramping up, and unless we get more uh, aggressive on, for, on uh, foreclosure prevention, the unnecessary foreclosures are going to be going up, too. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Vitarello with uh, GAO. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the TARP team. And I had a question. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> Where, you. You're keeping us very busy. <laughs> Not you, the whole TARP thing. But I have a question about the back end ratio and, uh -huh. and particularly total right. uh, household income ratio. Right. Right. Um, to what extent uh, does that help determine the future uh, success of a loan mod program? Mm -hmm. And to what extent has your uh, IndyMac program as well as your loss sharing uh, mm -hmm. proposal uh, taken that into account? Yeah. Well, we rely on front-end DTIs, but low front-end DTIs. A 31% DTI would be required under our, our loss sharing proposal. Um, back in, in an ideal world, you would look at back-end DTIs too, but the scale of the problem is such, if you get into that, you really are sitting down with the borrower, looking at their budget, you know, looking at their take-home pay, and there's just not enough time to do this. Um, so I, I think we rationalized using the front-end, you know, that, 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 that it was an important policy goal to provide an affordable mortgage payment to substitute for one that was not affordable and, and perhaps not affordable at origination or with a reset that was unaffordable at origination and with a low DTI, uh, front end DTI requirement to try to address the, that back end problem. But I just don't think it's feasible. Um, I don't think you can get the scale that you need if you require that they go through and, and try to, you know, get household budgets for all of these borrowers. I just don't think it's scalable. And that's how you're dealing with the second mortgage issue, too, right? That's right. For with modification, the second lien holder cannot get in the way of a modification because you're just restructuring the loan that's there already. Um, we do The IndyMac protocol does not require a principal write-down, and our loss sharing proposal does not either. I mean, certainly for those who want to do the principal write-downs to get to the 31 percent DTI, that, that would be a good thing. But um, one, one aspect of not doing a principal write-down, we do do, for about 10 percent of the cases, we have to do uh, principal forbearance. We can usually get to an affordable payment with an interest rate reduction and extended amortization, uh, where we have to, do, do, to, uh, to deal with principal. We, we permanently forbear it, meaning that you never have to make a payment on it, but if you refinance or sell the house, then you still have that no debt to deal with it. The There's no interest. But one thing it does for the second lien holders, it keeps them the same distance behind, because uh, some of the, the principal write-down uh, requirements have been criticized by the first lien holders as unduly helping the second lien because you you know you, you free up more value that they could potentially tap into um, so this does not and also back to bankruptcy the, the second lien issue I think the second lien holders really need to be realistic about what these second liens are worth right now and I've been told by bankruptcy experts that uh, if a, if a second lien is underwater the first lien cannot, but the second lien can be extinguished in bankruptcy. Um, so I think they do need to be realistic about uh, what those second liens are worth and, and uh, not stand in the way of, of, uh, of modifications or refinancings, and as well as uh, uh, you know understand that their leverage with the borrower and the first lien holder is very low. So if a reasonable offer is made to extinguish the second lien, they should take it. Great. Another question? Mark. Thank you. <coughs> Mark Willis, Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and two questions. One, uh, yeah. allow you, if you want, to elaborate a little bit more on this, um, the consensus or lack of it on a modification policy. Because, right. uh -huh. I, I, you know, getting the investors together, we know the mechanics of why, right. why it's difficult and a lot of different interests. But um, at least when I go around and talk to people, I don't think people are generally yet comfortable with what ought to be done, you right. know, the paradigm being. I paid my loan. The person across the street. Yeah, did, no, so. I think that's, that's I think that's absolutely right. And then and, I have a second question. Yeah, well, I, I think that's right, and uh, I, I think just we just need to keep 
messaging that uh, and get the economics out of why this makes uh, good businesses and good good economic sense. And, and I don't know what, how else to do it. I think actually, I think I sense a change in. Um, in public sentiment, though, I think there is a growing uh, public uh, support for doing something like this. I think, ironically, part of it is that, well, you know, you're kind of bailing out the big institutions, so okay, go ahead, you know, might as well bail out the little guy too, you know. So there's, there's some interplay there, and I think also just more people are being impacted. If their house, uh, you know, if they're not in trouble, you know, down the street, uh, you know, there may be an empty house that's not doing their home values any, any, any good. So I, I think there is, uh, and just in terms of the. Uh, the kind of email and stuff that I get has become more positive. <laughs> when we first went out with this, I was, you know, I can't tell you what some of the things we were getting, but um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we are getting the message out. And, uh, you know, um, you can have compassion for these borrowers, you cannot have compassion for these borrowers, but the economic case and the business case is just so compelling. I think we really need to move forward. So um, on modification uh -huh. policy, uh, I think we all agree we haven't been as uh, aggressive uh, as, as maybe we should have been. Um, uh, all the players. Right, uh, right. Uh, but, um, and I may have missed uh, earlier. I'm sorry, my train right. was a little late. Uh, uh, first question, uh, first part of the question would be, uh, wh what percent of uh, those that uh, are going uh, into default do you think could be helped? Uh, you know, there's a, Right. Well, well, we, we think... And, uh, and I'll just add, sure. so you can answer all that. And, and do you think it will change with Alt-A or Option Arms in terms of the percent that can be helped right. through modification? Well, our, our economists estimate that we think we can reduce foreclosures by about a third. So uh, for a program that would go through 2009, so that's about 1.5 million foreclosures. So in other words, those loans that became delinquent in 2009, the percentage of those that would ultimately go into foreclosure, we think we could reduce by about a third with this program. Um, so um, I, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Well, the, yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's more difficult because the option arms, well, Alt-A it's by itself, I mean, that, that includes a, a number of uh, different types of loan characteristics. The option arms are very hard to modify because you had the payment shock on these can sometimes double or triple, you know, the payment. So uh, if you don't have a, this, this does get in the situation where if they were disqualified at the starter rate, you know, making the lowest possible payment they could make during the introductory period of, of the uh, of the option arm, um, with having prices going down, they can't refinance, and, and getting them to an affordable payment, something closer to what they were paying at the introductory rate, if that's all they can afford, it's, very, it's much more difficult to pass the, uh, pass the foreclosure, the MPB test, compared to that for, to foreclosure value. So I think that is, uh, those are going to be tougher, but still a lot of them can be modified. Got time for one more question? Oh, come sure. on. One journalist. One journal question. Well, you won't be. Somebody else has already asked one. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one in the back. May I? May I? Well, wait a minute. We're going to do this one first, and then you can do it quickly. Go ahead. So, the, uh, the, one of the big talking. Uh, Where we'll, are you from? Oh, Alan Zibel, AP. Sorry. Um, on, on the 4.5 percent plan that the Treasury has been talking right. about, um, is it? I know that the initial plan, you know, might be to uh, just for new home purchases, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of people talking about applying this to refinances. Mm -hmm. Is it feasible to refinance everyone with a mortgage above 4.5 percent in America who might want to refi at that that attractive rate? Could that happen all at once? Well, and is it a practical solution to the foreclosure crisis? Well, it's. Um if you're underwater, no, uh, because you're underwater, right? You gotta you have some, you gotta have a little equity in your house to, to refinance. So I, I don't think that'll work. So the only way it'll work is if you, if the the owners of these mortgages would be willing to really aggressively write down principal, which they so far have have, have shown a, a, an inclination not to do. And again, the pooling and servicing agreements frequently uh, prohibit principal write down. So I think that is the main issue. I think getting getting the mortgage rates down uh, for for purchases at least will help clean out inventory for what's there already. I mean that's I think that's the theory, but I think that's that is where the impact would be. I, I don't see people who are underwater with distressed mortgages. I, I just don't see how it can help them unless the mortgage owner is willing to, to write down the principal. What about volume? Sir, sir, we've got one more person. Thank you, Brian Chappelle from Housing Market Report. Um, I just wanted to ask why you thought. It, from a program standpoint, the Treasury Department has been so resistant to the IndyMac 
concept or Gosh, program. I thought we could avoid that one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, and would, do you, you think know, that will change during the next yeah. administration? Do you have an indication? Well, I, I would say I think it's important. The Treasury is very supportive of the NEMAC protocol. They've been, they've been very supportive of it, as heads of the White House. And, and the, uh, the GSC, the newly announced GSC protocol, heavily draws on what we're doing at NEMAC, as, as does the Hope Now Alliance uh, protocol as well. So there's a lot of support for what we're doing at NEMAC in terms of systematic modifications. But the disagreement is, is whether you should use, you know, uh, TARP money to try to provide some financial incentives to get this done. Um, so, but we continue, uh, you know, we, we, we discuss this with everybody and, uh, and we're going to continue our advocacy and, and hope for the best. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's difficult work to get these loans restructured. Nobody's saying that. I mean, that's why the reason we've been emphasizing systematic approaches for what, about a year and a half now, because it is hard to do, even with the systematic approach, it's hard to do. But, you know, looking for the easy solution, just buying them all and restructuring. And, you know, it's a legitimate question, but, you know, it's not there. You know, and I think we kind of need to get away from this short-term thinking that we just write a big check and can somehow get all these loans um, undone. It's going to, you know, it's laborious to restructure them. We've got to work up, you know, roll up our sleeves and just work at getting it done. But making sure the financial incentives are aligned with, with that process I think is very, very important. And I think it's worth spending some taxpayer money to get it done. Thanks so much. Okay, you bet. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I would urge everybody to uh, stick around. The second half of this program is um, as exciting as the first, and we have some really good research to, to present. So just hold on as we move out here. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, joining us this morning, and uh, I'd, I'd also like to thank uh, Sheila Baer and, and my colleague Ellen Seidman for that uh, very timely and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we're now going to convene our panel on looking forward and how to make low-income home ownership uh, work. Um, I'm Reed Kramer. I work here at the New America Foundation uh, as research director in our asset building program. And I'm going to turn the panel over to my uh, colleagues and, and co-sponsors of this gathering at the Center for Community Capital at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, uh, Roberto uh, Garcia, um, Yannicka Ratliff, and Michael uh, Gernstein-Weiss. Um, they're all uh, accomplished uh, scholars, and their, their work really needs to be brought to bear on the challenges we're facing now in the, uh, in, in the housing markets. Um, uh, their, their bios are all in your, your packets. Um, they're going to present their work uh, evaluating a particular um, low-income housing uh, home ownership um, program uh, that was, you know, aimed at, a, at this particular uh, targeted uh, market. And uh, their findings have uh, major policy implications that I think we're going to try to draw out uh, in discussion. Uh, they're going to speak for about uh, 30 minutes, and uh, then We'll have some uh, remarks uh, by uh, myself, uh, Eric Stein, and uh, Mark uh, Willis. Um, uh, Eric Stein is president of uh, Center for Community Self-Help. Uh, Mark uh, Willis um, uh, is currently at the Ford Foundation, but a longtime uh, force in community development banking uh, from his perch at J.P. Morgan. Um, and their bios are in your packets uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, Roberto. Yeah. Thank you, Reed. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I am Roberto Kersia. I'm the director of the Center for Community Capital at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And on behalf of all of us, I want to echo Ray and welcome you all here. Um, I also uh, would like to uh, thank the America Foundation for putting this event together in such a short time. Uh, the current crisis may have some believing uh, that it is not a good idea to extend home ownership and lending to low-income families, moderate-income families, minority families. Um, our research seemed to show otherwise. Uh, this research started 10 years ago, uh, funded by the Ford Foundation, 
and led by my predecessor, Michael Stegman. Uh, taken together, the research we'll present today uh, has two conclusions. And if you don't remember anything else, just remember these two things. Uh, the first thing is that homeownership has similar benefits to low-income families that it does to their higher-income families. Uh, the research has been inconclusive. We have been able to actually measure that empirically. This, to me, to us, tells us that we should continue, despite the current crisis, we should continue to expand home ownership opportunities to all families. The second finding I would like you to remember is that done right, lending to low mode income families to minority families is viable and a good business. Our research shows that. This, to me, tells us that as we move into the future, regulators need to have the ability to discern between good lending and bad lending, between what is right and what is wrong, and the will to act on that knowledge. So um, I will, um, um, Yannicka Radcliffe, the Associate Director at the Center, will give us an overall introduction of the, of the uh, research and the program we are evaluating. Uh, Mikel will talk about the social impacts of home ownership, and I will conclude the presentation with the financial aspects of the program, including the importance of uh, delinquency uh, servicing and mitigations. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, New America Foundation. And uh, thank you, Sheila Baer, on so many levels. And uh, also thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to reflect on the issue of low-income home ownership with us today. We find ourselves at a time where it seems important to test all of our assumptions on this issue through observation and in light of the evidence. And we at UNC and at Self Help have some evidence to submit today, timely research that goes directly to many of the points raised by uh, Chairman Baer earlier. My task is to briefly introduce our study on Self Help's Affordable Home Loan Secondary Market Program, which we refer to as CAP. It's a little easier, short for Community Advantage Program. Self Help is one of the nation's leading nonprofit financial institutions. They're headquartered in North Carolina. And the CAP program provides affordable funding for mortgages to low income and minority households across the country. The, the program that's the subject of our research was originally announced by Self-Help in the closing months of 1998. It's a whole decade ago, and a whole lot has changed since then, but, but Eric and I, we haven't aged, aged a bit, have we? Um, at the time, Self-Help had heard uh, a, a need among banks who couldn't sell their CRA or their Community Reinvestment Act mortgages, because back in those days, Fannie and Freddie considered them to be too risky to purchase. This limited banks' capacity to expand mortgage lending in low-income and minority communities. Self-help, on the other hand, had been making loans to underserved borrowers for a number of years and felt confident in their ability to take on the associated credit risks. They were awarded a groundbreaking $50 million grant from the Ford Foundation, and with this funding in hand, they secured a commitment from Fannie Mae to buy billions of dollars worth of CRA mortgages from self-help, provided that self-help would take recourse. That is, self-help would pay for any losses that arose from defaults, a form of guarantee. Self-help could then go out and buy such mortgages from lenders around the country and sell them to Fannie Mae, thus uh, opening up uh, access to, for a whole new set of potential low-income home buyers to the vast uh, funding machine that Fannie Mae represented, a source of efficient, long-term, fixed-rate, standardized mortgage capital that's available through a broad distribution. Today. The program tallies 50,000 loans in 48 states, originated by roughly 40 lenders for a total of over $4.5 billion. Participating lenders could custom design their programs, but they had several features in common. Uh, the first among them was reducing the amount of cash a borrower had to bring to the closing table, sometimes as little as 1% of the uh, purchase price, for example. Uh, there was also flexibility around credit history and income, both in terms of thresholds and documentation. Now, all these loans were fully documented. There was no such thing as stated income, but many of the programs featured the ability to prove your, your credit worthiness and your repayment ability through non-traditional forms of documentation. And it reached its target effectively. More than 40 percent of the borrowers were minority. A similar uh, amount were uh, single uh, female-headed households. And the average income, 32,600, really shows how effective the program was in reaching its target market. Um, the median household earned uh, just about 60 percent of their area median income. Now, you might say, wow, that, that sounds risky. You know, I've read the papers. 
how sustainable is this kind of lending. Um, so though it's too early to tell, indications are so far so good. When we look at relative performance, uh, for example, the most recent release of uh, delinquency statistics by the Mortgage Bankers Association, we can see that the cap mortgages are dramatically outperforming subprime adjustable rate mortgages, uh, subprime uh, fixed rate mortgages, and even prime adjustable rate mortgages and FHA in terms of 90 and more day delinquent loans. But these are just broad brush uh, findings that don't give us a whole lot of insight into what's really going on here. Fortunately, thanks to the foresight of the Ford Foundation, a substantial investment has gone into a research component which has two primary parts. First, UNC has access to loan level information on every loan funded through the self-help program. We have the origination data as well as monthly payment histories, and then we supplement this with updated property values on the properties and updated credit scores on all the borrowers who remain active in the portfolio. Uh, further, to rigorously examine the effects of home ownership on these households, we pulled a random sample of 4,000 of the borrowers, and we call these uh, folks every year and put them through a survey. We're in the sixth round of uh, data collection right now. These surveys co cover topics like unemployment and household composition, details about their assets and liabilities and how those are changing over time, um, attitudes towards savings and credit, and then we get into things like voting and volunteering behavior and community engagement and parenting and that sort of thing. Uh, we also interview a comparison group of low-income renters who live in the same communities, and that way we can try to really isolate the effects related to owning a home of your own among the low-income population. The result is a rich data set that can help us better understand the home ownership proposition for these low-income households. Certainly, you've got bigger data sets out there. There's Humda and there's loan performance and so on, but we think this data really adds to the field for several reasons. First, it's focused on the affordable segment, so that allows us to really delve into issues relevant to that market. Second, in one place, we have information about the borrower, the neighborhood, and the loan, as well as things like credit store, score and property value, and it's hard to find data sets that have all those elements in one place. Third, the panel gives us an incredible depth of information. Just to give some examples, uh, we can look at the potential effects of divorce or unemployment. We can find out what kind of mortgages people refinanced into, or who moved from owning a home going back to renting, or who bought up, or who went from renting to owning. And fourth, and perhaps most important, we can use it. Um, other than Humda, there's not a lot of loan level data available out in the public domain. Since there's so much data captured in the private sector, that sometimes put the, puts the public welfare, I think, at a, at a disadvantage in sort of an information asymmetry. So we will make this data set uh, publicly available eventually. Uh, right now, it's still messy. We're still doing data collection. And there are a number of technical issues to address, such as you know accounting for the decreasing number of survey participants and really knowing exactly who we can generalize our findings to. But whether it's just good luck or uh, great planning, our findings capture both a peak and what we all hope is a valley in the housing cycle. Um, for example, cap, um, borrowers have most of their equity, uh, their wealth in their home equity. So how will that be affected by real estate value declines? And also we find the cap borrowers are very highly employed, typically both um, wage earners in a two-headed household are in the workforce, and so we'd be curious to see how unemployment or cutbacks in income might affect their um, financial condition and whether their housing equity will help them weather this crisis. So we seriously do want other researchers to help us make the most of this information as we um, investigate two overarching issues. First, uh, as a matter of public policy, is home ownership something we want to promote and why? and Dr. Grinstein Weiss will walk us through some of the social impacts we've been able to identify among the CAP uh, borrowers. And second, if so, how do we go about promoting it, particularly from a, a financial context, a financing context? And here Dr. Kersey, the Center's Director, will take us through a number of findings on the financial and business outcomes of the CAP model and the implications. So without further ado, Michal. Thank you very much, Yonika, and good morning, everyone. So as Yonika suggested, I'm going to walk you through our, some of our findings, our empirical evidence, on the effect of home ownership on social outcome. And specifically, I'm going to look on individuals, effect on individuals, effect on families, and effect on communities. Before I'm going to present our findings, I want to take just a few minutes 
to share with you some of our major strengths of our study design and our methods we use in our analysis to be able to draw really rigorous result from our sample. The first one is Bionica already mentioned, we're using quasi-experimental design. We are following this group of home owners that you know, bought their homes with the secondary mortgage program, but we're using a comparison group of renters. And we match these owners and renters by income and geographic locations. So really being able to tease out this home ownership effect. The second major strength of our study is the fact that we're using longitudinal design. We're following these people over time. We're able to look on some of these social outcomes over time, the effect of ownership over time. In the analysis method, we use multi-level modeling to account to the fact that our individuals are nested within different neighborhoods across the US. And finally, we're also using two-stage uh, regression modeling um, to account for the self-selection into home ownership. A lot of the research on home ownership is being criticized as the fact of there is this self-selection into home ownership. That some of the attributes that make you know, some people more likely to become homeowners are also the same attribute that make them more likely to vote, to participate in the community, and the, you know, to be more involved in schools. So we're taking some statistical technique to account for this self-selection in our analysis. Um, I want to share with you for a minute kind of a conceptual framework. So we're asking this question about whether homeownership has a you know, variety of different social outcomes. We're looking on social capital, neighborhood satisfaction, parenting, political participation, and volunteering. And while doing that, we're controlling for very important demographic, financial, and neighborhood characteristics. We're controlling for demographic characteristics such as education and employment, um, race, marital status, etc. We're also controlling for financial characteristics such as income and assets and car ownership. And finally, we're controlling for uh, neighborhood characteristics such as neighborhood stability scale, percent of racial composition within the neighborhood, etc. So let me show you the first set of outcomes and first set of studies that we looked on home ownership and social capital. We measure social capital as access one have to individual resources through a social network. We ask our renters and owners a set of questions, including how many people do you know who will help you find a job? Who will help you, um, who will lend you money when you need? Who will help you, uh, give you good advice when how to handle stress? And so forth. So you have a list of the questions we ask on the slide. Um, and what we are finding is that our own owners report that they are more likely to have more people that will help than that. They have access to more resources, and more of these resources are in their own neighborhood. Of course, this, you know, all the results that we share with you now from our studies we also uh, are statistically significant after controlling for this variety of control you know, demographic, financial, and neighborhood characteristics that just share with you. I'm showing you kind of a raw data, but we find it significant after controlling for all these characteristics. Um, this slide share with you our, some of our results about home ownership and neighborhood satisfaction. We ask our renters and owners, you know, a, whether they are likely to recommend their neighborhood to others. And we find that home owners are more likely to recommend their neighborhood to others. And they are also more likely to rate the neighborhood as a safe place to raise children. We look on neighborhood satisfaction because we believe this is an important outcome for us. You know, research indicates that people who are more satisfied from the neighborhood are having more sense of com community, they are, have higher quality of life, and they are less likely to move. So this is some of the reasons we look on neighborhood satisfaction as one of the outcomes. Moving to families' outcomes, and specifically looking on home ownership and parenting, uh, we find that our homeowners, again, are more likely to be involved in schools, in the, you know, kids' schools, and their children are more likely to participate in organized activities. Here. Continuing with this uh, home ownership and parenting, 
Uh, we asked a few questions about, you know, we looked on reading to a child and amount of time children spend in front of some type of a screen, whether if it's the TV or video or playing video games. So amount of time they're spending in front of the screen during a day. And surprisingly, we find that our renters report reading more to their children. We are not sure, you know, this is not congruent with what our, we expected and we're not still sure, you know, what is happening there. Um, but congruent with our expectation, we find that the renters um, pro allow the children to spend a little bit more time each day in front of some types of a screen. So television, <laughs> video, playing video games. Looking, moving into homeownership and political participation, our homeowners are much more likely to vote in local elections, are also much more likely to vote in national elections. And finally, looking on home ownership and volunteering and asking our renters and owners how much, how many hours they volunteer every month for these different organization groups they belong to, we find that our owners report to volunteer more time during, you know, any months. So what we can draw from that? We believe we have here, like, evidence that the are social benefit from owning your home, that our owners does report social benefit. This is consistent with this policy that focus on expanding low income home ownership while doing right, and Roberto will talk about it with you in a minute. And I also want to tell you, stay tuned. There is a lot more to come. We are, as Yonika suggested, we are in the midst of data collection. We have a lot of more data we haven't got to it. There are a lot more outcomes we are going to look at. We have child outcomes coming up, other different social capital, social um, outcomes that we'll be looking, civic and community engagement. We want to you know, keep looking on these changes over time, and you will hear a lot more from us in the several years to come. And with that, let me invite Roberto Thank to you. talk about financial considerations. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thank you, Michael. Uh, the, uh, I will talk about um, um, six or five different aspects of, of the financial um, um, part of the program. I will uh, talk about the uh, evolving relationship between the program and capital markets. The program has changed over time. It's 10 years old already. I will talk about the performance of these loans. I will talk about the uh, building wealth um, equity component of the program, even during the economic downturn we are experiencing now. I will also talk about whether borrowers in this program refinance into risky subprime mortgages. And finally, I will share with you the findings we have come and, and estimated on the importance of servicing and well-timed uh, and appropriate uh, loss mitigation strategies. Um, the program, as Yannick said, is 10 years old. And uh, uh, it had really changed in nature. Uh, when the program started, CAP was um, very innovative, was actually pushing the market, pushing lenders to make really what at that time were considered risky loans based on a borrower's ability to pay, low down payments, yes, but they were basically fixed rate mortgages with escrows and a lot of other things that we consider today uh, mainstream. As the uh, subprime mortgage market uh, grow, grew um, and uh, the cap was actually left behind, and so it, went, it was much more aggressive, uh, the subprime market and cap. And so over time, the Community Advantage Program provided an alternative to um, risky subprime mortgages. We have done an estimation and, um, uh, about the impact of this over time, and we see that over time uh, um, it went from increasing credit in neighborhoods to actually substituting for subprime mortgages in different census tracts. As we move, as we see the, uh, the, the program into the future, we believe that it's going to be a back to the future. Subprime mortgages are mostly gone, and we believe that given the fears in the market about lending to certain groups and doing certain kinds of lending, CAP can have a role to play about showing again that this kind of lending is actually uh, viable if done correctly. Um, the uh, next slide talks about the performance of CAP loans. And uh, in here, the concern we have always have as researcher is how can you measure the performance of two products if you don't hold the borrower constant? 
can a borrower cannot get two different mortgages and, and, and then you can see what the performance is. We actually did this statistically. We have a borrower that have this exactly the same, very similar risk profiles, and we followed the performance given that one had a community reinvestment loan and the other one had a subprime loan. And as you can see, this 24 months after origination, the risk of serious foreclosure, serious delinquency in subprime loans is almost four times as much as for a community reinvestment loan. This tells us, again, that the, for this kind of borrower, there is a right way to lend and a wrong way to lend, and subprime mortgages are the wrong way, have been the wrong way, and we are very fortunate they are doing. Um, given the uh, uh, market downturn and the weakening of the economy, one of the things we were interested in looking was about the wealth building aspects of, of this program and how uh, borrowers have fared over time. And as you can see, the, um, the program has shown a very significant equity return. Um, with very small down payments, um, uh, uh, borrowers have, uh, or the medium borrower have uh, gotten an average of about $30,000 in return. Even after the downturn, the, that uh, medium equity return is positive. So for the medium borrower in our program seem to be doing well, we look at this at, at different states, and except for a couple of states, Ohio, as in some of the Midwest, the program is actually still experiencing positive equity. So we're very fortunate to have this suggest very good underwriting and probably knowledge of the market when the, when the, when the mortgages were origin, originated. Um, even the equity built up in these mortgages, and these were uh, low mode income borrowers that in the absence of cap probably would have gotten a subprime mortgage, we were interested to see how many of these borrowers refinance out of their com this community investment product into a subprime mortgage and how many tap their equity. And as we can see, most of these borrowers actually stay uh, in the um, uh, prime market. They actually refinance to um, benefit from a lower interest rate, uh, while only about a third tap into their equity, and only a third of those, so six of, the, of, the, of those that refinance, got a high cost of prime. So overall, the mortgages that uh, these families refinance into after getting a community reinvestment loan seem to be more mainstream. Um, our contention is that as they get their first loan, this community investment loan from a financial institution, a mainstream financial institution, they go and refinance in those same institutions and get another mainstream kind of product. Uh, we're going to be looking at this more in detail in, in future work. Um, uh, which brings us to the problem that we have today that um, Chairman Baird was talking about, that is the issue of uh, intervention. The market is softening, uh, what can we do? Uh, fortunately, the program has a really very uh, proactive um, uh, f delinquency or foreclosure intervention program, and uh, Eric can talk about the specifics of that uh, when uh, he talks to you, all of you. Uh, we found that the odds of curing are over 2% greater for those that receive uh, post-purchase um, delinquency counseling, this intervention. Even if done over the phone, the probability of curing a loan is much higher. And even if people are 60 days delinquency or more, a delinquent or more, the probability is 80%, almost a fifth greater of curing than in the absence of, of, of counseling. So counseling seems to be playing a key role. Uh, as expected, more intensive counseling uh, results in higher default, uh, higher uh, cures of delinquency than less intensive counseling. And based on this work and other research we've done at the center, uh, financial assistance to the borrower, either in the form of a reduced rate, um, an emergency loan, principal reduction, really uh, increases the likelihood of curing and decreases the likelihood of redefaulting. So we read that this should be part of any strategy as we move forward uh, uh, looking at the, at the uh, uh, current crisis. Uh, overall, I think to us these findings suggest that servicing needs to be tailored to the uh, uh, specifics of the mortgage instrument and the borrower we are dealing with from day one. We shouldn't wait for a crisis to determine what kind of servicing these borrowers and these borrowers with particular mortgages need. This needs to be thought out at the time of underwriting 
And that service you need to be put in place, even when at times, when most of the times, the government don't have any problems. Um, let me uh, conclude with some thoughts about uh, what we have learned from our research and other we've done at the center. Uh, how to do right landing doesn't seem to be too complicated or too uh, rocket science. It's basically going back to the basics. And the writing based on ability to pay, use fixed rate mortgages. In the rental market, we learned that adjustable rate mortgages were risky long time ago and we never, we never use them anymore, uh, yet we use them in affordable housing. We need to require escrows. We need to um, um, have adequate uh, back-end, front-end ratios reflecting uh, families' ability to pay. We need a smart servicing. And we need, for what we learn, have learned from the Community Advantage Program, a community reinvestment um, kind of lending, uh, we need long-term engagement between borrowers and lenders. Lenders need to know about their community to be effective lenders in that community. As I mentioned before, I believe that servicing needs to be lined up with the specifics of the mortgage and the borrower from day one at underwriting. Um, and we believe that CRA lending, uh, as the CAP program is, uh, occurs in the context of a broader market. And so as CAP and the, the importance of CAP have changed over time as the market has changed, we believe that CRA lending um, has that also, the, um, the potential impact can be in the same way. Uh, we do believe because CRA is done through accountable participants, uh, entities are regulated, that this is a way to promote this kind of lending. And uh, overall, we believe that done right, as, as you have seen, home ownership for low income, moderate income families, minority families is a good business. And done right lending, uh, to these families in the right way is, is a profitable business to those lenders that get involved with it. So, thank you. Thanks, um, Eric Stein, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Self Help. And as mentioned, we're a nonprofit community development lender. We've financed over $5 billion worth of lending to 55,000 households, um, small business owners, and nonprofits around the country with a loss rate of under 1%. We have our secondary market program that um, was discussed, and the goal of that is to create wealth through home ownership. And we are gratified to hear that um, the wealth uh, gains have been positive. That's primarily what we were looking for, and we assumed, and it's uh, nice to hear about the social benefits as well. Um, the reason that we um, promoted home ownership is that it is one of the very few leveraged investments that low-income families can obtain. If you have a 3% down payment and if you can get housing appreciation of 3%, you're increasing your, um, you have a 100% return on your investment each year, assuming you're in a sustainable mortgage that you can stay in, which, as we've learned, is a, is a big assumption. The current housing crisis, caused largely by abusive lending, has threatened some of these gains. Hopefully they'll remain. Um, but uh, now, in, there are some places in the country, clearly, where now is not the right time for low-income people to buy. Um, should wait for the prices to settle down. We started um, focusing on predatory lending back in 1999, when we had borrowers come to us and astonishing loans, which are not as bad as some of the ones we've seen recently, that more we looked at it, we realized it was actually legal, which outrageous, and that's when we started working on um, predatory lending and created the Center for Responsible Lending, who I also represent. The middle part of this decade, Wall Street demand led to over $2 trillion worth of subprime and Alte lending. Alte lending often is undocumented income. Um, the, and these were put into private label, label securities. In 2006, the top five investment banks earned over $1.75 billion securitizing subprime loans. Wall Street paid the most for the most dangerous loans. In 2004, for example, Countrywide was paid by Wall Street 1% for a regular conventional, conventional borrowing mortgage, like Roberto was talking about. For the exact same borrower getting in a subprime loan, Wall Street paid Countrywide 3.5%. So you can imagine what Countrywide decided to promote among its loan officers. Roberto showed back in, um, in Center for Community Capital back in January 2005 that the, uh, the terms of subprime loans are statistically more likely to result in foreclosure but because Wall Street was paying more for these loans, these are the ones that were favored. Um, these are the loans that helped start 
helped cause the housing bubble, the common denominator being, as Chairman Baird discussed, they started looking artificially cheap and then built into the structure of the mortgage is a large increase in payment that people can't sustain and that allowed people, um, that really contributed to the housing bubble going up, um, but it, the fact that these were unsustainable mortgages were hidden as the housing bubble went up, people would not be able to afford this mortgage and refinance into another one. But once the bubble popped, the fact that these are unsustainable mortgages become clear for all to see as the foreclosures occur. Um, these, and this really strikes directly at our mission, not just the borrowers um, that we're involved with, but um, our mission is, is broader than that. The majority of, of African American mortgages in this country over the last several years were subprime loans that are having these astronomical default rates of 40, 50 percent. In many cases, 40 percent of Latino borrowers were, um, were subprime. It's when we and others, um, and many others, tried to raise the problem of these mortgages over this um, decade, the response that we often got from regulators or from Congress was that we can't interrupt the free flow of credit. I think it's pretty clear by now that the lack of common sense rules, such as, for example, the borrower should be able to afford the mortgage that they're provided, has impeded the flow of credit beyond anybody's wildest dreams. Since the problem is rooted in excessive foreclosures, then this is where the solutions must start. First of all, um, I'd just like to reiterate everything that Chairman Baer said. We think that uh, we need to have mass, uh, sustain, sustainable, systematic modifications, and the TARP plan that passed is really the best lever to accomplish that. The modification guarantee program that she promotes we think is very promising and can induce investors and servicers to do a lot of modifications. Um, Secondly, when the government buys equity in a bank or purchases assets from it or buys a whole loan or controls one, in that case they should also insist on a systematic loan modification program similar to IndyMac. Um, and that's exactly what she, uh, Chairman Baer insisted successfully with the Citigroup bail bailout. She insisted that there be systematic modifications as part of that and that became part of the deal. Um, seems to me if we're providing a lot of tax benefits taxpayer benefits to institutions, they should be at minimum um, doing what is probably in their long-term financial interest, um, which are these mod modifications. The second thing that we think should be done is that Congress should lift the ban on judicial loan modifications, which we think would save hundreds of thousands of foreclosures at no cost to taxpayers. The mortgage on a principal residence is the only secured debt in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy that cannot be modified by the judge which may have made sense back in the 70s when that passed, when mortgages were, were boring, but now it really doesn't make a lot of sense. I'd like to give one example to kind of illustrate why this is so. Candace Weaver is a school teacher in Wilmington, North Carolina. In 2005, she refinanced her mortgage from a conventional one uh, because her husband had a heart attack and they needed to, some cash out. They received a mortgage, the interest rate seemed a little bit high, but not terribly so, 8.9% um, from an obscure lender called BNC. It turned out that this mortgage is a subprime 228 exploding mortgage, which she had no idea about um, because that's not what was represented to her. Two years later, the rate went up to 11.9 percent, which she could not afford. She was then diagnosed with kidney, kidney cancer and had to have surgery scheduled. So she called her servicer saying, I'm going to be out of work, I'm going to miss the June payment. Can we work something out now because this surgery schedule, I know it's going to happen. The servicer said, no, until you're delinquent, we can't do anything had the surgery, um, sure enough became delinquent, called the servicer and said, uh, can we work something out now? I'm back to work, but I can't afford, I can't pay the arrearages as well as the 11.9%. They said, can't talk to you until you get into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. She calls again once she's sure enough in foreclosure because she couldn't handle it, and they offered her a repayment plan where she'd put the arrearages and pay that every month in addition to the 11.9% mortgage, which she had no prospect of doing. And there's no, she had good representation there was nothing that a judge could do um, to help her out. On the other hand, consider Lehman Brothers. They were purchasers and of these 228 mortgages and securitizers earning hundreds of millions of dollars in fees. A huge investor in these mortgages at 30 to 1 leverage, which the failure of that has really rocked the world economy. And they owned a lender called BNC, the very same lender that made Ms. Weaver the loan. Um, that was the subject of a Wall Street Journal investigation that found falsification of tax forms, cutting and pasting documents, forging signatures, ignoring underwriter warnings. Pretty much every problem you could imagine um, was evidence at BNC. 
they're able to run to court, which they did, as everybody knows, to receive Chapter 11 bankruptcy, where their debts can get restructured. This, there's something not quite right with this, fic, this picture. Um, we also need to focus on making sure that these abuses don't occur again looking forward. Our biggest focus is trying to prevent foreclosures, but that's something that we, while the moment is here, we need to also work on. Um, we need to really pay attention to the financial incentives placed on originators that led to the crisis because you can have, you can ask people to do things, but if they're paid more to do something that's dangerous or bad, that's exactly what they're going to do. I think we've learned that. So first off, the Federal Reserve um, HOPA rules are, are good, but they ignore yield spread premiums, which is when lenders incent loan officers, they pay them more if they put people in worse loans with higher rates. So what are they going to do? That's what they're going to do. And those protections, which are pretty good, need to also be extended to non-traditional mortgages, payment option arms, um, interest-only loans, other loans. And secondly, Congress needs to pass a law that protects against abuses needing to retain, I also agree with Chairman Baer, retaining assignee liability to ensure investor accountability for the loans that they buy. If we've learned anything by now, it's that Wall Street will buy loans that maximize short-term revenues regardless of the long-term effect on homeowner sustainability unless they have financial incentives to ensure good lending. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Eric. Um, I'd like to use my uh, comments here, my, my remarks, to uh, you know, connect some of the research findings to the current uh, landscape, which, which as we know, as we've heard, has really changed dramatically uh, in recent months. And, and it, first off, I think it is important to recognize that, that, that this is a, a housing crisis that we're in, and it's, uh, it's really urgent. Um, the, the recession and the associated job losses are going to create a lot of widespread hardship. Um, I think we're going to see things get worse next year before they get better. And uh, it's going to add a great deal of pressure to this housing finance system that, that's already uh, under uh, attack. Uh, and if we, we examine the, the, the roots of, of this uh, current housing mess, um, and I think mess should be the technical term we use now uh, because there's so many forces that have had have converged. But if we look at it try, uh, clearly, uh, you know, we're going to see uh, at, at the root uh, situated in, in um, the housing bubble and, and falling uh, prices. Uh, you know, certainly there was a policy push for increased home ownership. Um, but the market did most of the work in creating this appetite for, um, you know, mortgage-backed securities that would be sliced, diced uh, in multiple ways uh, and in such a manner that it became really difficult to understand the underlying, you know, value uh, and ultimately price of these uh, instruments. Um, the market uh, initially did encourage some uh, the, the subprime lending, uh, but this initially was seen as an innovation and, uh, you know, the advent of this risk-based pricing uh, was, a, was a means of getting good people into, into loans that could work for them, into good homes. But uh, too often, we did see predatory practices that got good people into bad loans that they couldn't afford, as Eric just uh, described with a, with a very poignant uh, example. Um, and, you know, ma many of the advocates that were out there uh, certainly didn't see all the dangers and risks of home ownership. It would have been nicer to have a little bit fuller discussion of those risks. But often, those are the advocates that really weren't involved in housing finance. And a number of people and groups were paying attention, such as the Center for Responsible Lending, such as self-help. And too often, uh, you know, their, their um, concerns went uh, unheeded. Um, and I'm glad that uh, uh, Chairman Baer really started her uh, remarks off this morning with uh, talking about CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that the, the claim that this is the root of the housing uh, crisis is, is such a weak claim with very little empirical evidence uh, that really it needs to be enforced. As she said, it was never an excuse, CRA was never an excuse to make loans that uh, weren't going to, to work, weren't going to perform. And there were many ways to get an outstanding rating for banks that were uh, assessed under CRA uh, by making, uh, uh, you know, safe, sound, and fair lending practices. And, and in fact, many groups were doing that. And as she also, I think, uh, uh, highlighted, a lot of the, these loans were not uh, covered by CRA uh, anyway. Um, certainly, uh, th th these are facts that have been known, they've been discussed. Um, I had included in your packets uh, uh, an editorial from the New York Times from October, which really laid out the case quite clearly. Um, 
And um, it, it hasn't stopped people from recycling uh, these talking points that were initially aimed at undermining the case for any kind of regulation of financial services. And then I was distressed to see the Times just last week publish an editorial on the right side of the uh, op-ed page that, uh, not an editorial, but an opinion piece that really brought up the CRA claims uh, again. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I thought that uh, we'd, we'd beat this back, but clearly the attack continues and, and the work uh, goes on. And so it, we need to continue to debunk this uh, claim. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think this distracts us from the real work, which is to create and think about what the elements of a new regulatory framework uh, would be to deliver appropriate um, financial products. Um, the, the research here is really uh, important because it, it does confirm that there is a responsible way to do home ownership. There are ways to make it work. Um, Self-help went ahead and they created their own product. And we now see that it's made a difference. Um, so this really is a, is a key finding that needs to be heralded. Um, we can do so today, but I think the, uh, the, the work will, will, will go on. Um, I'd like to emphasize that it's really not just uh, the product that was at the end of the game, but it was a whole process that probably um, made a big difference for, for uh, home buyers. And uh, so it's the process and the product that really matter here. And I think there's a lot more to be learned about the process, and I'd like to see the research move more in that uh, direction. But I think that uh, nonprofit groups, uh, housing counseling groups, a bunch of mediating uh, institutions, intermediaries, are going to play an important role. The other thing that the process needs to do is it needs to in, 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 in incorporate um, consumer safeguards and uh, accountability. And the, the issue then becomes, what does accountability look like in today's um, uh, changing environment? Uh, we've got low consumer confidence. We've got an uncertain future for a number of financial uh, institutions. Um, so it is, I think, a, an open question. Uh, clearly, uh, accountability needs to extend to whatever the financial, uh, whatever the terrain is where these financial services are being delivered. So we've had the rise of the alternative sector, and they need to be covered uh, as well. As we, as we move forward and, and create this new framework. Um, safeguards also uh, can be embedded into the process, um, perhaps uh, in ways that lead to a default product that has uh, the consumer safeguards uh, already there, uh, creating products that work for a number of people um, unless they kind of opt out and, and make informed choices uh, uh, for something else. And I think that there's a lot of work uh, that can be built on here that's coming out of the behavioral economics framework that's quite uh, promising. Uh, another safeguard I want to um, mention is just the, the role of savings and, um, you know, uh, down payment uh, that, that come out of income or that are saved up over time, you know, should be seen as a safeguard. And I think we're already seeing this um, uh, happen uh, naturally in the market. But it has a lot of implications for people getting, getting into the pipeline and getting ready for, um, to become homeowners. Um, and that uh, means, uh, you know, the, the length of time it's going to take a family to save up that down payment is going to increase. And what I think that means is responsible home ownership, that discussion needs to be kind of contextualized into a broader discussion of housing policy generally. And, uh, we, you know, we need to consider, you know, strategies for re re revisiting the rental housing market. Uh, the time is right to do that. We also need to be looking at alternative ownership strategies like shared equity, uh, housing, and also the delivery of federal uh, rental housing assistance, such as the way we give out uh, Section 8 vouchers and also access to, um, to public housing. So, um, you know, this research is, is unique in some ways because it's not just an academic exercise. It has real um, implications here, real value. And I think we need to use what comes out of it to establish the foundations for uh, supporting responsible uh, home ownership uh, going forward. And I think foremost, we need to connect people to products that, that are appropriate, that work for them, uh, that meet their needs, that mitigate risks. Uh, and secondly, we need to look at these insights in crafting the response now of uh, homeowners that are caught up in this uh, housing uh, crisis. So we do need to be thinking about modifying these, uh, you know, the, the terms of existing mortgages, as we've heard uh, today. And, and we've heard that it's complex work, the scale is quite large, but uh, it's essential work that's going to have to be done and needs to be pursued uh, energetically. Um, people have to be able to stay in place uh, to some degree. Uh, contracts are going to have to be 
uh, revisited, we're not going to benefit. The economy's not going to benefit. Families aren't going to be a, able to benefit by, by having some kind of mass um, displacement here. And I, I don't think this is the time to teach, uh, you know, character lessons. Uh, I think people are going to get it, and uh, we're going to be able to um, work on, on modifying behavior uh, in, in other ways going forward. And, and then, uh, you know, we are going to need more federal resources, whether it's uh, the next uh, tranche of, of TARP money or another, um, uh, you know, quite substantial flow of cash. Uh, coming early next year, and it's probably uh, the right time for, for Congress to be thinking about how to, how to make that happen. Uh, but the self-help approach uh, does clearly show us a way forward, and we're going to get better outcomes when we match um, home, home buyers with, with uh, more appropriate mortgage products. Um, all right, so those are my uh, comments. I, I want to bring up Mark uh, Willis um, for a few remarks before we'll open it up for some audience questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Reed, and thank you for inviting me. Um, the few remarks, does that mean I got like five minutes, five minutes something like that? Um, I'm going to do something uh, even a little bit uh, more different here, but first uh, let me thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, do my uh, usual disclaimer, I had nothing to do with the grant from Ford. I've only been there for a few months, and uh, I'm, a, as I quickly tell people, a grantee, not a grantor. So. Um, Nevertheless, this is an area that I've uh, worked a lot in, um, and I found the research uh, fascinating. Uh, and uh, uh, it's terrific uh, what you've done to think about um, uh, the CAP program and, and also obviously to see the results of it. So I have a whole set of questions, and I'll just sort of uh, lay them out, and you can choose or not to uh, comment on them. One, obviously, um, I'd like to start here, obviously. Um, agree that the right product matters. You know, putting something in a 30-year fixed uh, uh, seems quite sensible, making sure they can pay and all that. Um, I was fascinated by the data that um, showed that the 06 cohort was uh, having higher delinquencies than the 04. I'm wondering whether there's any learning in that. Um, so, because both of them extend into today. Um, and 06 uh, is a more recent cohort, so you'd expect it to have lower delinquency in normal times. So uh, what, what have you uh, learned about that? The second uh, thing I noticed is that the delinquency rates for CAP in what I'll call normal times before recently, obviously it's performing uh, uh, relatively well now, was always higher than prime. Um, and uh, what does that tell us when we get back to a normal market, what we should think about CAP uh, in terms of sustainability? Uh, you know, I am an economist by training, risk-based pricing. Does it mean we ought to charge a little bit more for it? Uh, alternatively, have you learned anything about uh, any additions to the product? Uh, one thing that uh, I, I've, uh, I guess I use the word speculated about is uh, why different um, groups have different uh, credit scores, uh, distribution, different ethnicities, different races. Uh, you can see that in the Fed study that, that was done. And one might be there's less deep pockets. Um, and what that means is when you do have, and we all do, um, stuff happens uh, uh, in one's life, what's our ability to get by it? And is there a product design that ought to think about, you know, helping people for short-term medical emergencies, loss of job, whatever, but to help them get through that? And is there any learning that you've, in your research, you've been able to uh, uh, think about uh, that? Um, you know, Obviously, we're all struck uh, by the need for more modifications. I thought uh, um, that uh, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Baer's comment about a third maybe could be helped. Uh, whether that's the right number or not, two-thirds can't. Uh, this is having a huge impact on our neighborhoods. And are there any thoughts that you have about what to do in these neighborhoods? Because if they completely decline, it will be harder to get, I think, home ownership opportunities for exactly the people that uh, uh, you want to help you at the low, as I call it, low and moderate income marketplace, a, a CRA term. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, um, agree homeownership is uh, uh, what research I've said has benefits. Uh, I think we have a societal, and I think Reed raised this question about how much we should be pushing home ownership in general for all income levels. Um, and um, I'm just wondering also in that um, work that you did there, did you control for length of tenure in a neighborhood? I happen to. So if people have been living there for five years and they're renters and homeowners, 
did you control for, for that piece? And I'm seeing that you did because uh, obviously that's an important piece. Not everybody can rent and obviously renting uh, people's, depending on people's uh, lifestyle and what they expect changes can determine whether they choose to be a renter or a, home or a homeowner. So the causation goes both ways and obviously something that you need to control for. And so I'd, I'd be interested here or elsewhere in, in hearing more about that. The last piece is, uh, some of you may know, that, uh, one of the things that I am doing at uh, Ford is working on CRA and thinking about, as I choose to say, uh, reinventing uh, CRA. Um, I'm not sure I understood the statement CRA lending occurs in the context of broader lending markets. So I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that um, uh, because, uh, well, I think uh, Many of us, uh, certainly myself, would think that CRA is important. I'm not sure it's the solution to everything. Um, and I'm not sure what it is the uh, solution in the future, what role it should play in terms of helping uh, provide a, a better uh, mortgage market, um, particularly when we know there's some direct things that, that we need to do with regard to uh, regulating mortgages, like requiring people to be able to make sure they can pay. Uh, ability to pay and, and, and those sorts of things. So that's just a set of thoughts that I had uh, listening to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you uh, uh, have some response over here? You can share the mic and I'll um, stand up here. Yeah, if he has something to say, we'll bring him up. So do you have um, some sure. comments? Sure. Uh, I'd like to just uh, answer briefly so we have time for a broader question and answer. Uh, uh, Co mortgage uh, cohorts are like wine. Some vintages are better than others. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the old sick cohort uh, seems to be not a very good one compared with others uh, in general. Uh, the reason why we see, um, um, we think uh, uh, a worse performance for the old sick cohort is they bought at the peak of the market. So while the people that bought before have seen equity appreciation, that they can tap and, 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 and uh, refinance if they need to. And so there is less, uh, uh, there is more to play with for earlier cohort than for more recent cohort with that when they bought at the peak of the market and then prices started to, to come down. Uh, with regard to the um, um, cap having a higher risk than prime borrowers, uh, prime mortgages, that's only with regard to fixed rate mortgages. If you compare cap with adjusted prime. I, I meant to just with fixed rate. Yeah, that's so. A great comparison to make, but. Yeah, the, the comparison, uh, in our, uh, our feeling and looking at the numbers <laughs> is that the borrowers um, uh, in cap have a, uh, a riskier profile than typically prime borrowers. And so, uh, but if you, because we see the adjustable rate of prime be significantly higher than cap delinquencies. We think that the mortgage instrument is what makes the big difference here because prime borrowers with adjustable rates are more than double the delinquency rate of cap borrower. Uh, with regard to the um, different groups having different credit scores, we are looking at that. Uh, we are uh, very concerned that uh, uh, the foundations of credit scores start in uh, college. Uh, you kind of get that from your family, the resources they have. We are looking at uh, school, uh, college debt, and how that affects the credit options of recent graduates even before they get the first real job, and how that may spiral down into worse and worse credit options if you have a huge uh, college debt. So that's an important issue that we'd like to see and study more to see how, why, how people get into this pipeline of different credit score buckets. Um, we have not looked at what can be done with those two thirds that Chairman Bear said you couldn't help. Uh, we will, um, um, the, the, the concern we have um, is that <coughs> there are, in a way, three different crises that are interrelated and feeding into each other. And so, uh, arguing that the, f uh, the uh, uh, foreclosure crisis now is, is an issue only of mortgages is probably too narrow to do. And so maybe the solution to those two thirds got to do more with the credit markets and more importantly with the economy and the stimulus we are talking about passing. And so it seems to me that the solution to that may not be no loan um, modifications, but kind of a broader kind of policy initiative from government. And um, we did look at length of tenure and um, uh, the, with the regard to the CRA uh, happening with the broader context of market is 
uh, because lenders operate in a market and CRA allows them to uh, some flexibility and adaptability on the tools they use, the kind of mortgages they use to serve CRA purposes. Uh, we do not, as you, we don't think CRA is a solution to, any, uh, to everything, but we do think that, um, at least based on our analysis, that is the right way to serve certain borrowers. And so um, uh, there is something to say about the, 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 the positive impact that community reinvestment lending has in serving a market, and it has done so very well for 30 years, and that um, the Main Street market, if you will, uh, wasn't able to serve in, in any significant way. I'd be glad to talk some more afterwards and answer you. Yeah, Let me follow up. yeah. thank you. All right, uh, let's open the discussion here. Yes, in, in the back, and then people just wave to me. Great. Judy Kennedy, National Association of Affordable Housing Lenders, a group that represents CRA covered banks and blue chip nonprofit lenders. Um, and I have to tell you that listening to this presentation today has been very painful for me, um, in part because I'm delighted um, with your, uh, how really granular your data is, but in large part because um, we could have had this conversation 10 years ago. Um, there's nothing new here, <laughs> um, and the Federal Reserve did a study uh, uh, in 2000 um, of CRA covered loans uh, that isn't as granular but has basically the same conclusions. So for the last eight, ten years, I've been listening to bankers and nonprofit lenders complain about um, the fact that to sell a CRA covered loan to Fannie Mae, they had to pay a premium to self-help. Um, that had a grant from the Ford Foundation to essentially be an FHA for Fannie Mae loans. Put another way, um, I'm wondering, maybe this question is to Eric, um, the extent to which self-help now regrets uh, <laughs> enabling Fannie Mae to the point that um, it's self-destructed and not getting the message out earlier that in addition to these wonderful $5 billion of loans, each year there were hundreds, hundreds of billions of responsible CRA boring mortgages made that the Fannie and Freddie refused mm -hmm. to buy. Great. Take it from here. Okay. Thanks, Judy. Um, so, uh, on a couple of Mark's questions. First off, on the 2006 loans, they are vintages that perform better or worse, and they're lenders that perform better or worse. And I just regret to say that uh, there was a lender in 2006 that had a lot of loans to us that we then cut off that didn't perform as well as other ones, and that, that's sometimes just a part of part of life, I suppose. Are regulating your market. Sorry? Are regulating your market. Exactly, exactly. Um, in terms of what to do with neighborhoods um, where there are foreclosures, we're working, we have a couple of pilots going to on lease purchase mortgages, but the idea is to get the houses occupied quickly, and a lot of people are going to be credit impaired, and they're not going to be able to buy anytime soon, so if you can have a nonprofit um, or somebody else leasing the house to them at a, at a with a mortgage that they can then assume, then they can get home ownership in the future, um, but aren't taking all the risks of it up front. So th that's one thing that we think should be seen. In terms of our relationship with Fannie Mae, um, I think uh, there's I don't think Judy's not making this claim, but a lot of people have that uh, Fannie Mae fell. It's the same attack as against CRA. The Fannie Mae fell because they tried to help too many poor people, and the government made them do it, and that was the problem. Whereas, um, which, which is not what Judy's saying, but uh, just to continue the CRA discussion, 10% um, of Fannie and Freddie's loans are Alte loans, primarily undocumented income to higher income people, higher loan balance loans. That's causing over half of their losses. The um, problem that, had, that doomed Fannie and Freddie and why they got taken over by the government was because they followed the market into the private securitization, the private label securities, because that's where the action was and it, it wasn't, it was not a good move. It's interesting, subprime has not uh, caused their, they also invested in the AAA tranches of subprime loans, which helped feed that market, it didn't drive that market. That's not what's caused a lot of losses for them because they were sub, um, there was enough subordinated um, tranches that the losses haven't crept up to them much. So they uh, entered subprime, they got killed by Alt-A, um, and I believe that the loans that we help credit enhance that uh, went to Fannie Mae have helped Fannie Mae. They, um, 
Mark could maybe talk more about their relationship with banks in uh, terms of making loans, uh, buying loans from lenders. Fannie Mae by their charter, they have to share recourse with somebody. And what we were doing in this case was um, taking recourse. In some cases, mortgage insurance companies will do it. In some cases, lenders are willing to do it. In many cases, they're not willing to do it. So we feel as though we were filling a niche. Um, and the, uh, the loans that they were able to buy, um, Fannie and Freddie um, CRA loans performed well and not like the subprime loans or the Alte loans did. Hi, Melissa Coide from the New America Foundation. Congrats on this data, excellent. Uh, one of the data points that you had I thought was very useful and speaks to some work that we're trying to do here around how do you connect sort of post mess, how do you connect lower income households with financial advice, counseling, and planning? Uh, a data point, Roberto, that you mentioned I thought speaks to this and I'd love to hear more of it. And it's the question of do you or actually can you attribute the 66% of those who re refinanced into prime loans as a result of the financial education? Uh, because I know you were doing ancillary wrap-on services to um, participants in your program. Uh, that's a good question. The answer is yes. We actually, um, again, and I apologize to the prior um, questioner and to all of you for not presenting the details, but we have short time and we were told that um, um, details are not very sometimes confusing. And uh, but I encourage you all to go to our website. It has more methodology and details that really you care about. But uh, we did include fin um, the residual of financial uh, counsel uh, community counseling in our models, and it's actually significant. Uh, uh, borrowers are more likely to do the right kind of refinance to when they. It's called the option is in the money. Basically, when interest rates were low enough to make the option to refinance positive. And so uh, we feel that that's an important finding given that uh, although commercial counseling is not very extensive in general, maybe eight hours and maybe longer sometimes, they, they have received enough to actually understand when it was convenient for them to refinance. And again, this is people that refinance to good fixed rate mortgages, not the subprime mess. So we did look at that, and if you look at our paper, I'd be glad to send you a copy. Uh, it has the actual impact that that receipt of that counseling has in the model. And the website? Uh, in our website, yeah. And w the address? Uh, what do we have? We'll, we'll get it up there before we get uh, Cliff, do, do you have a question? Then I'll come over sure. here. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> again, congratulations. And uh, the curse of providing data is that you get more questions. Um, and so perhaps the answer to my question is on your website, but it seems to me that uh, the real headline news is per perhaps not in the general overall data that you've presented today, but to understand more about uh, the different performance of different lenders, the performance of different financial instruments, and the performance in different regions, uh, because we have very different dynamics uh, based on those three factors the instrument, uh, the, the lender's incentives, and uh, the property values in that area. So I wonder if you could uh, at least touch on, on those areas. Did you observe, did you get a chance to analyze that data, and do you see differences? We, we actually did a paper on that and actually published it, looking at uh, servicing practices of the different lenders. And uh, our conclusion was that not all uh, servicing is created equal. Uh, even within the program, there were differences in, 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 and there was really m uh, an effect, a positive or negative effect of a servicer on the performance of the loan. Um, I, I don't know if you want to say, you probably were more involved with that. No, I would say, uh, Cliff, we take these things like property value trends and other characteristics of the loan up front into account when we model the propensity to default. And we're constantly updating those models. As you can imagine, it's kind of a moving target. Another thing, Roberto, you might want to mention the research on the risky borrowers, risky mortgages. What attributes of the subprime product were most associated with greater likelihood of default? Yeah, the, um, um, the, all the models we have have geography. We include that variable. So we capture for, for that, some of that market issue. Uh, in our risky mortgages, uh, risky borrowers, we, we actually uh, um, look at both the cap and the subprime market. Uh, we uh, uh, include all the um, uh, 
mortgage, all the uh, factors that are included in the underwriting, we have that from the loan tape, uh, credit scores, uh, loan to value, savings, uh, employment, everything that you can get, you get in the underwriting uh, file. And uh, we also um, uh, include the uh, geographic issues, e economic variables, uh, in the capture some of the external factors that may affect the family. And we also include uh, personal things like uh, from our survey, like a crisis event that happened in the, in the life of a family and other sort of things. So we believe that the data we have is very rich to be able to capture some of those local and, and regional issues. And we, have, we do that to the extent possible in all the models we have. And in this servicing one that I mentioned, that is also in our website, we also include that. And we tried, we did some, a couple of case studies of the services to try to understand why those differences existed. Uh, Conrad, in the back there. We want to take about four more questions here. We can keep. Uh, th detail. Thank you, Reed. First of all, yeah. congratulations on an excellent program this morning. Uh, I wanted to raise a different kind of issue, and maybe this falls into the additional research category. Roberto and team, um, the, the rental option. Um, it, it seems to me that the current events, the mess as you've described it, uh, be, uh, begin to open up some interesting research questions about, A, what would have happened had they not bought, had they continued to rent, particularly from an asset standpoint. They wouldn't be underwater. They wouldn't be on the street. Uh, and secondly, uh, to what extent is, is, is renting uh, a, a also a viable option uh, from the standpoint of some of the objectives that we f too frequently look just to home ownership for? And uh, your study doesn't look at these questions, so I'm not suggesting that that, that you can address those directly, but I'm just thinking, A, if you had any sort of gut instinct observations and whether these are the kind of things that we might want to look at more in the future. I think that's a great question. Uh, uh, like Eric mentioned, uh, there are some um, organizations, including self-help, that is looking at rental as a way to um, deal with some of these neighborhoods that are highly impacted by foreclosures, by allowing uh, borrowers that for, are foreclosed on to stay in the house as renters, or maybe get new renters eventually with the idea of buying. Uh, we uh, also believe that um, um, there is an impact, obviously, of length of tenure, and all homeowners are less, uh, um, less likely to move than renters. Um, on an aside, I, I have been trying for many years to convince the, the Ford Foundation <laughs> to fund a research in Paris. <laughs> France have a seven-year lease uh, for rentals, and I want to compare uh, U.S. <laughs> they haven't Paris, uh, is it? Uh, Paris, they haven't agreed to that. Uh, but th there is something about the 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 the, the, uh, the other things that come from home ownership, and uh, uh, that I think are important. Uh, wealth building is one of them. Uh, involvement, as 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 she mentioned. I think the important thing, whether home ownership work or didn't work at the moment, I think was when people bought in the cycle. The closer to the peak um, our families purchase, probably the least benefit they got out of the experience, and probably they're in the worst trouble. But if people bought earlier, um, um, earlier on in the early 2000s, even if they, um, they have experienced some accumulation, although from the peak maybe the, 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 the prices have dropped. Uh, there are some programs that uh, we have been talking about exploring. Uh, one is, I think, in Cincinnati where there is, a, there is a company that does rental properties that includes uh, equity buildup. Uh, they actually pay tenants. Uh, you, you earn points, and after a certain amount of points are accumulated, it's converted into cash that the family can use like an IDA for whatever purpose. And it's just a private sector a rental company that has come out with that scheme. They have a very stable a set of renters, which reduces their cost. Maintenance are done because the renters take care of the property. And so there are ways, I think, in which some of the benefits we have seen in home ownership could be transferred into yeah. rental, but I don't think it has been as widespread as probably could be, and maybe this is an opportunity to explore that, yeah. And we've already seen some uh, uh, model programs with shared equity that this seems like a version right. of, and, and, and they're, 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 they can happen now. It's just a matter of getting some of the word out. Okay, um, we're going to take the last three question comments in sequence and challenge our panelists uh, once more. So uh, right here, and then in the back, and then in Ellen. And make it, we only have a few moments left, so if we could do a quick questions and comments. Thank you. Yeah, Chiao Chen, uh, freelance correspondent to the UNC group. You are a state university. 
Do you look at what uh, this affect the community in North Carolina? And uh, to you, you talk about this, uh, this piece of uh, editor. And uh, do you have uh, some comment on this? And also generate this from this. This uh, subprime mortgage uh, is uh, a century innovation. And uh, this uh, crisis is in 30 years in the making. Can you name five person, five institute, and five congression uh, action uh, uh, contribute to this? Thank you. OK. And behind you, yeah, Layla. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Applequist, Understanding Government Foundation. I was impressed by the results you had for CAP, given the high loan-to-value and relatively low income. And I'm just uh, curious if these um, loans were done in areas where there was lower unemployment rates, were you able to control that, especially if you have two wage earners? And kind of a speculative question with what's happening in the economy now, do you think if you did your study now or a year from now, if unemployment continues to go up, what do you think might be happening? Okay, and up front here with uh, Ellen. Um, Ellen Simon from New America, and it's a follow on on that, which is um, low down payments um, could mean that there are people with sufficient savings and disposable income that they still have control over to deal with emergencies. On the other hand, it could mean that they've stretched to the limit. Did you, did you explore the issue of savings beyond the down payment? Right. Yeah, just curious, uh, th this program and, and uh, Michael Barr have floated the idea of an opt-out mortgage taking the behavioral economics approach to mortgage products, wondering if you think that has, has some possibilities. Okay, thank you. Last right, word? I go in there one, yes. one at a time. Uh, quickly. Make a question. Uh, we, we did uh, look at North Carolina. We had a, uh, in North Carolina, uh, many of the uh, um, um, program loans are in North Carolina, so we have looked at this as a separate thing. We're also working for the North Carolina Commissioner of Banks, uh, collecting some data on foreclosures, and if you go to <coughs> North Carolina foreclosurehelp.org, you will see all the maps we produce with that data. So we have looked specifically in North Carolina as well as other places, but we do have a, a local presence in there. Uh, with regard to the appreciation and performance, and uh, the analysis is to the third quarter of 2008. So this is as recent as you can get. Uh, we do this periodically. We have an arrangement with uh, uh, Fannie Mae. Uh, we get them um, 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 uh, um, updated property values every semester. Um, every quarter, I think. Sorry, semester. <laughs> I'm an academic. I, I apologize. Uh, uh, every quarter, and so we can update these, and we got the last numbers uh, for the last quarter. So we feel the numbers with confidence that this reflect what is happening in the program. That, that this mean that the future will look like the past, we don't know. It will depend on how bad things get. Uh, I assume as you, could, you could see the equity gains were kind of getting very small after the downturn, and if the things continue to deteriorate, it may become negative at some point, at least for the, for the median borrower. Yeah, we will continue to follow that, and um, if we have another event uh, at some point in the near future, we will uh, we'll share some of those results. We have looked at, um, uh, but not to the extent that uh, we would like about the savings and how the stress is dealt in the families. We are considering expanding the study uh, for a few more years to see how families are managing through the crisis. Uh, and how they had rearranged their budget, savings, debt, uh, use of other things to do that. And so, again, we'd be glad to report when we have some findings about it. And um, I forgot the last Yeah, one. well, that was pretty good. A good effort. Uh, the uh, to the yes. opt-out mortgage, I would say, Ray, that um, in, in many ways this product served as an opt-out mortgage for the borrowers yeah. in those communities where they were available. That mm -hmm. was the pr uh, preferred product of choice. Yeah. All right, well, there is more information on their website, uh, ccc.unc.edu, on our website at newamerica.net and assetbuilding.org. And um, thank you all for coming and for our panelists and our C-SPAN audience. Um, uh, thank you.